Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology on a Saturday. We're going over the topic of can a pope be a heretic? Now, I've done multiple shows on this before, but I'm going to address this from an angle that I have not yet touched on. Um, and that is specifically from Bishop Gasser's Relatio related to the First Vatican Council. Don't worry, I'll explain what that means, but it's a very important document that helps give perspective on Vatican I, which is the ecumenical council that taught people infallibility. Um, and, you know, there's some work that has been done here by Emmett O'Regan. He published back in 2017 with La Stampa an article called The Heretical Pope Fallacy. And he's uh, still working on this. But what I'm going to just kind of go over here uh, as I go through the primary sources is just kind of present... Um, some observations that uh, Emmett O'Regan has made about papal infallibility, heretical popes, you know, can the pope be a heretic, that kind of stuff. And so certainly borrowing from his work, and I want to acknowledge him as the individual. In fact, I'll put a link to his article in the show notes uh, for La Stampa. I would read it to you here, but for some reason I keep getting a block that comes up. Uh, from La Stampa <laughs> uh, when I pull it up. So I'm just going to send you all the link. But um, instead of reading his article, I'm just simply going to go to the primary sources themselves, read through them, um, and, you know, put forward the perspective that he argues there uh, in La Stampa, which I find to be certainly a, a possible um uh, position that one can maintain, if not, in fact, probable, a probable and likely reading of Vatican I. Well, this is pretty relevant because we constantly see people saying the Pope is a heretic or the Pope has taught heresy. And so we have to ask, the, you know, several questions here. Can the Pope personally be a heretic? If so, what kind? And then can he teach heresy? And if so, to what extent? These are the types of questions that we have to analyze. And in order to do that, we need to recap our terms here. Uh, material heresy is a term that refers to pretty much a state that one can be in. Um, a person can have the wrong understanding though not knowingly. They, they don't know that they're wrong, but they have a wrong understanding. And let's say they have a wrong understanding of dogma. Let's say they have the contrary view of a dogma. You know, one dogma would be uh, Jesus is fully God. Well, what if somebody believed, well, Jesus isn't fully God. He's only 75% God. He's a, he's a semi, you know, demigod. Uh, but they don't know that that's heretical. They don't know that that's erroneous. They're, they're in good faith here. They're just ignorant. Um, well, we can say that they're in a material, material state of heresy. We can say there's material heresy there. Um, and I know, by the way, some of these terms have been used differently by others. I'm just kind of using them how they're commonly used today. Um, so material heresy is you hold to something that is contrary to a dogma and the dogma being something that is revealed by God and the church reveals it and in, in the church confirms it as revealed by God. Um, so when you oppose a dogma, you're actually holding the heresy, but you could do so unknowingly. That's material heresy. Then you also have what's called formal heresy. That is, you know, better. You know that this is heresy. You know it's wrong. You know you're supposed to believe otherwise. And yet you obstinately maintain that. That's formal heresy. And by the way, it could be either obstinately maintaining the false view or just obstinately doubting the true view. Notice the key word is obstinate. It's willful. You're resisting the truth. It's intentional. You know. Um, that is formal heresy. Now we can also speak of public heresy, heresy being something publicly expressed. Uh, so if a person were to hold this privately, you know, hold a, maintain a heresy knowingly or unknowingly, 
in their heart, but it's private. That's what's called occult heresy. Occult meaning it's hidden. Occult just means hidden. Occult heresy versus public heresy, which is you actually are expressing it. You know, you're, you're putting it out there in one way or another, verbally and writing through a hand gesture. Believe it or not, you could gesture uh, to heresy in some instances. There's been some theologians who have discussed it, uh, which I've, I've found pretty fascinating because you would, wouldn't normally think of certain gestures as, as being heretical. But uh, suppose if somebody asked you, well, do you believe this heresy? And you go, that's a gesture, right? Uh, but it's clear that you're affirming the heresy at that point. Um, well, anyways, I digress. We can also speak of manifest heresy. Now, there's different ways in which this has been interpreted, or I should say defined. Uh, but, you know, one figure like Robert Bellarmine is going to define manifest heresy or manifest heretic is he's not only somebody who has a wrong view, that is even a heretical view, not just material heresy. And, and it's not just publicly expressed. And it's not just formal in nature, that is, they know better, but rather they've actually been rebuked by the proper authorities twice, and they remain and persist in it after the rebukes. That then becomes manifest. Prior to the rebuke, they are not manifest heretic. They might be a formal heretic, and they might have even expressed it publicly, but they are not yet a manifest heretic. Okay. So now that we have some of those terms out of the way, let's let's kind of dive in here. Well, Vatican I, as, as I'm sure we well know, is the council that solemnly defined papal infallibility. Now, papal infallibility had been expressed prior to this. It's rooted in Scripture, um, and other councils had brought it forward already. You can already see the indefectibility of the teaching office of the Bishop of Rome being expressed at the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Um, so you can see it even in the first millennium. It's already been expressed. Um, and there were things even after that where it was asserted um, further. But it kind of culminates with Vatican I where it's solemnly defined. And now it's not just merely expressed at a council. It's now solemnly defined in, in a dogmatic definition. Um, so Vatican I, 1870, which I think 1869 to 1870, it ended abruptly because of a war that broke out. And so Vatican II ended up finishing it, if you will. But um, uh, it was a you know, short council, and it only got to address issues concerning the papacy it didn't really get to deal with the episcopate it was going to but then didn't, didn't get the chance so it focused on the papacy uh before the war broke out and it infallibly defined that when the pope teaches ex cathedra that is from the chair of saint peter um under certain conditions namely three conditions that it's on a matter of faith and morals that he defines it um and that he's um binding the universal church um if all three of those conditions are present. His teaching is infallible in nature. It, that is, it is without error. Infallible means without error. Um, so, you know, it might not be expressed in the best possible way, but it's still free from error. That's what infallibly, uh, infallibility means, and that is what Vatican I put forward. And, you know, most people in these discussions, when we speak of uh, heretical popes, they kind of already know that. But there's some interesting things about Vatican I that Emmett O'Regan points out from Bishop Gasser's Relatio that some people may not know. Um, and for those who are not familiar, Bishop Gasser was a really important figure at the First Vatican Council. And he gave a speech, or rather what's called a Relatio, prior to the bishops voting on papal infallibility. You know, before they vote on the document, there's a speech that kind of explains to them, here's what you're voting on. Like, here, here's the me meaning. And, and by the way, I'm going to also answer any objections or reservations that people have so that we can properly contextualize what you're about to vote on. So obviously this takes place before the vote, before the bishops vote on papal infallibility. Um. 
Bishop Gasser, very important figure there, gives a speech explaining this document you're about to vote on for papal infallibility. Here's what it means. And he's also fielding objections. And one interesting objection that he dealt with at the time, again, as uh, O'Regan points out, and you can see this if you read the relatio, the, the, the speech, if you will. It's here in this book called The Gift of Infallibility. The Gift of Infallibility. Bishop Vincent Ferrer Gasser. Translated with commentary by James T. O'Connor by Ignatius. So, if you read the relatio, you'll have kind of a, a good understanding of the context behind the document that the bishops voted on. So it's not magisterial in and of itself. That is the, the relatio. It's not part of the magisterium, but it has, it's an interpretive key for the magisterial document, Pastor Eternus, that uh, teaches papal infallibility. So in other words, if you want to properly understand Vatican I and papal infallibility, you go to the interpretive key, and that is the relatio. So it, it might not have magisterial weight, but you could say it has interpretive weight, if you will, um, because it explains the meaning, the intention, the context behind this. Well, prior to this speech at Vatican I, before we look at it, there had been people who were speculating on the question of, can a pope be a heretic? Can a pope teach it in heresy? Um you know, Robert Bellarmine, St. Robert Bellarmine, Cardinal and Doctor of the Church, wrote profoundly on this topic uh, in this work right here. So uh, it's a pretty large tome here on the Roman Pontiff in five books. And uh, he kind of goes over it in multiple places there and has a lot to say. But he goes over the various opinions that were at the time. And one of those opinions specifically is important because one of those opinions... It, it seems there's a really good case that could be made. One of these opinions about the question of a, her, a heretical pope um, was what the council fathers were accepting when they voted on Vatican I's uh, teaching on papal infallibility and the document Pastor Eternus. Um, but again, before I do that, I'm try trying to lay just a little bit more groundwork. You did have some instances where people claimed that popes were heretics in the past. The famous case being Pope Honorius. Now, I've done multiple shows on Pope Honorius here already. I'm not going to repeat that here. I'll just put those in the show notes. You're welcome to watch it at any time. But it seems pretty conclusive that he did not actually teach heresy. How does that work with the Sixth Vatican Council teaching papal infallibility and also with the Sixth, I'm sorry, I said Sixth Vatican Council, Sixth Ecumenical Council teaching papal infallibility. Um, but likewise, the same Sixth uh, Ecumenical Council um, maintained that Anoyas was a heretic and condemned him as such. How does that work? Well, I have a, a whole video specifically on that. I will put in the show notes, go and watch it. Um, but I, I think it's shown that Honorius was not a heretic, um, and he, he certainly did not teach heresy, uh, let alone does it seem that he even held, he held the heresy. It seems that that wasn't the case. Um, and that's also something that Bellarmine put forward. He defended Honorius, and he also addressed other accusations that Protestants were making, saying, well, this pope... Uh, Liberius was a heretic, and so-and-so was a heretic, and this guy was a heretic. And he addresses all of that and shows that the popes, these popes weren't heretics. There's, of course, the famous case also with John the Twenty Second, where in some of his homilies, he was putting forward an erroneous view on the uh, beatific vision. Um, and it was his successor who dogmatized the opposite view than the one he was putting forward in his homilies. However, on his deathbed, he did retract his heir. That is John the 22nd. He did retract his heir on his deathbed, um, uh, or actually prior to that, I should say. Um, and it was also, and he also made it very clear that he never intended to bind the universal church to this false teaching. Um, and then after him, the question of the beatific vision was dogmatically defined. 
And so at that point, if you were to deny it, it's heresy. Up until his time, it was an error, but it wasn't technically heresy yet. Be that as it may, um, he certainly held to an opinion that was theologically an error. It was theologically untrue. He wasn't putting it forward in his magisterium, but he privately held to it. But he wasn't obstinate, and it wasn't formal in nature. It was more material. When he realized and was corrected, he accepted the correction. So it wasn't obstinate. It wasn't formal. It was material in nature. That will be important uh, for what, what's going to come here in just a moment. So now that we kind of laid this groundwork, let's take a look at what Gasser says in his Relatio, because this is how Vatican I understood the papal ministry. Um, this is what they were effectively voting on, uh, which, of course, again, the document passed, so we know it's magisterial. But here's how they understood it. I'm going to skip to page 58 here, where Gasser's kind of at the end of his speech. And he's fielding objections before they vote on the document. And he says, as far as the doctrine set forth in the draft, that is this document, it's still in a draft state because they haven't yet voted on it. As far as the document set forth in the draft goes, the deputation is unjustly accused of wanting to raise an extreme opinion that of Albert Piggius to the dignity of a dogma. So some are saying, look, this draft that you're going to have us vote on here, which again was approved, this draft, you know, it kind of it kind of seems like you're putting forward and you're wanting to dogmatize the opinion of Albert Piggius on the question of a heretical pope. That's That's the objection that he's about to field and respond to. Um, and he's going to explain what Albert Piggius's view is. So here we go. For the opinion of Albert Piggius, which Bellarmine, that's Cardinal Bellarmine, indeed calls pious improbable. So Bellarmine was actually in favor of Piggius's view. He calls it pious improbable. Was that the Pope, as an individual person or a private teacher, was able to err from a type of ignorance, but was never able to fall into heresy or teach heresy. Stop, stop, stop. Let me let me explain that. We're not just talking about teaching heresy. Piggius is also saying, and Bellarmine approves of this view, that the Pope, even in his private person, as a private individual, even outside of his capacity to teach, he cannot be a formal heretic. Now, he's not using the words formal heresy there, but that's the meaning. Because you'll note, he says, well, there could be an, a level of ignorance there. He, he could hold to the wrong view out of ignorance. What would that be? That would be material heresy, right? So they're not saying that the Pope can't be materially in a state of heresy that's not in question here they all take it for granted the pope could be in a state of material heresy but could he privately formally be a heretic like you know formally maintain heresy even privately not just in his teachings but just in his private person could he obstinately oppose a dogma of the church. Well, Piggius is saying no. He could be a material heretic unknowingly. He he's in a state of material heresy. But he could not formally be a heretic. That is obstinately knowing better. And again, this is prior to being corrected. This isn't even a question of manifest heresy. This is just could he knowingly maintain a heresy? Piggius is saying no. Bellarmine is then saying, Piggius, his view is, is probable um, and pious. But, but it goes on. To say nothing of the other points, 
let me say this clear from the very words of Bellarmine. So Gasser is now going to say, okay, this isn't just Pigius's view. This is Bellarmine's view. And now I'm going to quote Bellarmine to you, he says. Both in the citation made by the Reverend Speaker and also from Bellarmine himself, who in Book 4, Chapter 6, which we'll look at here in just a second, pronounces on the opinion of Pigius in the following words. So here's what Bellarmine says about Pigius in his view. It can be believed probably impiously that the Supreme Pontiff is not only not able to err as Pontiff, but that even as a particular person he's not able to be heretical by pertinaciously believing something contrary to the faith. Gasser says, from this it appears that the doctrine in the proposed chapter, so the proposed chapter in this draft that the bishops are about to vote on, which they do vote on and accept, it's not just the opinion of Albert Pigius. He says, from this it appears that the doctrine in the proposed chapter is not that of Albert Pigius or the extreme opinion of any school, but rather that it is one and the same which Bellarmine teaches in the place cited by the Reverend Speaker and which Bellarmine adduces in the fourth place and calls most certain and assured, or rather correcting himself, the most common and certain opinion. Okay, so what is he saying? It really does seem... Now, I'd be happy to hear somebody who pushes back and say, no, I think you're, you're misreading... Um, gas, or here's what he was getting at. I'd love to hear some feedback. Um, but it really sounds like what Gasser is saying is that, you know, people are accusing this draft of teaching just some weird, obscure teaching of Albert Piggyus. But in fact, no, this teaching isn't just unique to Piggyus, it is actually confirmed by Bellarmine. And that is what we are accepting here. We're accepting Bellarmine's view. And Bellarmine says that this view is certain, most common, pious. And what is that view? Well, that he, the Pope not only can't be a heretic in his teachings, but also that he couldn't be a heretic that is a formal heretic privately. So that's kind of what, Emmett O'Regan is presenting. That's the take that he has. And when I read through it, I, I, can, I can see that. I'd be happy to hear a person who offers pushback and says, no, I think that's a misreading of, of the Relatio. I'd love to hear it. But it does seem like Gasser is saying, well, look, that is what is being endorsed by this draft. The view of Bellarmine, which is the view that the Pope cannot formally be a heretic, I, either in his teachings or in his private person. Though he may, through ignorance, hold to or utter or maintain a heresy. In other words, material heresy. It seems like that one is, is acknowledged by all parties here. Um, but what is rejected is the notion that he could teach heresy in his magisterium or that he could be a formal heretic in his private person. Um. You know, now O'Regan takes the position that this was then dogmatized by Vatican I. Um, it's uh, I, I could see that being a possibility, um, or I could see it being the case that at the very least, this part would be authentic magisterium, and the dogmatic definition is simply limited to this section that deals with ex cathedra, and everything else would be authentic magisterium. Uh, so it could be that this is merely authentic magisterium, um, or it could be that there's just kind of a misreading here, and this is this is not what Gasser was trying to get at. I'd be happy to hear if somebody says otherwise. But it, again, it does kind of seem like there's a pretty strong case that one could make that the Vatican I fathers were, at the very least, authentically teaching this view of Bellarmine, that the Pope cannot be a formal heretic, um, even in his private person. So that would then mean the Pope can't teach heresy even non-definitively, if that's true. Um, because they were not only protecting his magisterium, but also him as his, in his private person. Um, so 
for those who would say, you know, this or that pope has taught heresy in his magisterium, I would say this that that seems to be in conflict with what the Vatican I fathers were saying, among other places. Now, let me also read to you that section from Bellarmine uh, in his work on the Roman Pontiff. This is uh, from the edition that I have, page 489. Uh, so this is book four, chapter six uh, from Bellarmine. He says, he says of the fourth position, it is probable and may, be, and may piously be believed that not only as Pope can the Supreme Pontiff not err. And this is why I say, um, and, and I think when he's saying err here, they're talking about the error of heresy. They're not talking about a lower grade of error. I think they're talking about the grade of heresy. Um, so whenever this seemingly is accepted by the um, the council fathers as interpreted through the relatio, uh, they're not saying that the Pope can't teach error of lower grades in his magisterium. What they're saying is that he can't teach heresy. Um, and neither can he even be privately a formal heretic. Not only as Pope can the Supreme Pontiff not err, but he cannot be a heretic even as a particular person by pertinaciously believing something false against the faith. So again, neither in his magisterium nor privately. And by the way, I, just to show that I'm not redefining his use of the term err here, I'll point out that in his day and for centuries even later, a lot of the theologians did not seem to distinguish between infallible teachings of a pope, non-infallible teachings of a pope, and then private opinions of a pope. That middle category of non-infallible teachings of a pope, it's implicitly there, but they don't really address it a whole lot and deal with it a whole lot. In most cases, they just kind of gloss over it. And they focus on those two other categories, what he teaches infallibly or what he does in his private person and says in his private person. And this huge gap of everything in between, which would be authoritative teachings that are not private, they're authoritative, they're part of his ministry, but they're not infallible. They don't really address that a whole lot. So when he's speaking here of air, he's not talking about of lower grades of air that the pope can't air in his magisterium and lower grades he's not he's not talking about that because he's specifically talking about in the context of heresy and moreover they don't really deal with that middle middle category unfortunately so when he talks about air here he's, he's talking about in in questions of dogma and matters of faith um not necessarily in you know other lower lower levels of doctrine um it says it is proved because it seems to require the sweet disposition of the providence of God. And in other words, God would not providentially allow for the post, the Pope to either be a formal heretic or to teach heresy in his magisterium for the Pope, not only should not, but cannot preach heresy, but rather should always preach the truth. He will certainly do that since the Lord commanded him to confirm his brethren. And for that reason added, I have prayed for thee that thy faith shall not fail, that is, that at least the preaching of the true faith shall not fail in thy throne. How, I ask, will a heretical pope confirm the brethren in faith and always preach the truth? Certainly God can wrench the confession of the true faith out of the heart of a heretic, just as he placed the words in the mouth of Balaam's donkey. Still, this seems to be a great violence and not in keeping with the providence of God that sweetly disposes all things. It is proved, for to this point, no pope has been a heretic. So he says even up until his day in the 1500s, no pope has been a heretic. Or certainly it cannot be proven that any of them were heretics. Therefore, it is a sign that such a thing cannot be. So, as I've pointed out before, Bellarmine doesn't believe that a pope could be a heretic, N not a formal heretic. It seems that he believes that you know it's possible one could maybe through ignorance be in a state of material heresy, but he doesn't believe that a pope could formally be a heretic or teach heresy. Now, isn't that odd? 
given how many people who are constantly raising Bellarmine in defense of the position that a heretical pope automatically loses his office, completely taking Bellarmine out of context. Because he's theorizing there, if you had a heretical pope, he was of the opinion, and it was just an opinion, that the pope would automatically lose office if he's a formal heretic. Actually, I'm sorry, not a formal heretic, if he's a manifest heretic. That is, he's been rebuked twice. That was Bellarmine's view. Not just a formal heretic, but if he was a manifest heretic, that is, he's been rebuked twice by the proper authorities, and he still maintains it, then he automatically loses office, according to Bellarmine. And that was just merely an opinion. But this was more of a theological exercise that Bellarmine was engaging in because he didn't believe that that could ever even happen. As we see here, Bellarmine doesn't believe a, a pope could ever be in this situation, that he would be in a state of manifest heresy and therefore lose the papal office. He, he doesn't believe that. But what people will do is they will quote, I've seen Taylor Marshall do it and I see a lot of set of a contest do it. They will quote, I saw Father James Altman do it, also said of a contest now. Um, I, they will take Bellarmine and they'll point to these theoretical discussions that he has and they'll confuse what he says about a manifest heretic with somehow a formal heretic. They confuse those things. They don't seem to realize what he believes about a manifest heretic. Um, and then they also think that this was his view. When, in fact, he's saying, well, if the Pope could be a heretic, then this is the view I would maintain. But, in fact, I don't believe this view because he can't be a heretic. That was Bellarmine's view. They always miss that latter part. Bellarmine didn't even believe this. So if Bellarmine were alive today, he would rebuke all those people who are saying that maybe Pope Francis is a heretic or has lost the papacy. Father James Altman was saying Pope Francis teaches heresy and has lost the papacy. Um, and therefore he's in a, you know, right now he's a set of contests because he doesn't believe there is a Pope. So they'll take Bellarmine, completely abuse him, misunderstand, and then neglect all this other stuff that Bellarmine says that a Pope can't even be a formal heretic. And again, if he were alive today, he would be correcting all of these people. And yet they're trying to use him to support their position. It's it's interesting uh, because Bellamy cannot be used to substantiate their claim uh, for the reasons I've mentioned here. Well, anyways, I hope this was helpful in just kind of throwing it out there. Um, you know, what, what O'Regan puts forward in his La Stampa article, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Definitely go and check it out. I think there's a pretty good case for what he's saying here. And so if this position is true, it would not only mean that the Pope can't teach heresy even non definitively in his magisterium, it would also mean that the Pope can't even formally be a heretic. So Pope Francis, you know, if 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 you want to say, well, Pope Francis, uh, you know, I think he he maintains this heresy or that heresy. At the most, it would be material heresy, if that's even true. I'm not even acknowledging it as true. I'm just saying if that's true, it would just be material heresy because the Pope can't actually be a formal heretic. He can't knowingly accept heresy, um, you know, ac according to this uh, presentation of Vatican I via the relatio of um, Bishop Gasser. So I'd love to see some interaction with it uh, from pe people. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Put them in the comment section. Um, and, and definitely, you know, subscribe to this channel so that the channel will continue to grow and reach more people. So if you want more people to see this content, you have to interact with the video, especially by subscribing, by the way, hit the bell for notifications. So, you know, when I go live, but also hit the like button and comment, the more you interact with the video, more people will see it. So again, if you've appreciated this video, if you found it beneficial, just, just go ahead and do me that favor, interact with the video in one way or another, comment, like subscribe, all of the above, preferably, um, and then also, if you want to support what I'm doing here with the channel, um, this is my main source of income. So if you want to support me and so I can continue to do reason and theology, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology is the uh, link that you'll go to to support me. And you'll also get access to extra content. Also, I will put a link in the show notes to a GoFundMe if you want to support me there. Um, so certainly go and check those two things out if you've appreciated and benefited 
from this channel. All right, so that's going to do it. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. ReasonInTheology.com Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.